Good morning, everyone. This is Mike Reynolds, and I'd like to welcome you to this morning's forum, where Quentin and I will be discussing asset management master planning and how the master planning process has evolved over the last 10 years or so. This is Mike Reynolds, and I'm a mechanical engineer by uh, training and spent about 28 years in uh, manufacturing where I worked at a uh, large 500-acre facility in Pearl River, New York. I began my career as a maintenance engineer in the uh, early 1980s where I introduced vibration spectrum analysis to uh, the site. Uh, 100 buildings and a campus-like setting with very diverse operations, manufacturing, research, office administration, had a wastewater treatment plant and incineration, solvent recovery, a uh, large utility system. So I kept very busy and remained uh, current with evolving maintenance strategies. Uh, within the cogeneration application, there was uh, some poor app time. So I began focused on improving availability through reliability-centered maintenance and total productive maintenance efforts. Uh, eventually, plant management took notice, and then I began uh, my career uh, leading engineering and maintenance activities, and eventually uh, had the opportunity to lead a global maintenance excellence uh, program around the world. So uh, as the uh, assistant vice president of engineering and maintenance, I eventually became, became very heavily involved uh, due to the Pfizer acquisition of my company as the engineering integration leader. So a lot of what I'm going to share with you today is based on uh, that experience. Yeah, I'm Quinn go for it. I'm, uh, um also a mechanical engineer. I'm uh, affiliated with the SMRP, and I'm a certified maintenance and reliability professional. I'm also a Lean Six Sigma black belt, and uh, we'll show today how we've applied that Lean Six Sigma uh, methodology to evolve the, the master planning approach and even our assessment approach. I've worked in maintenance and reliability uh, approaching 15 years now. and I've been a part of a, a number of improvement initiatives where we've gone through a similar master planning efforts. Um, with the ultimate goal to uh, you know, optimize the management and utilization of the assets. So I look forward to the, uh, the presentation today. Also, we'd encourage you to use the chat room to uh, pose any questions as we move forward. Uh, we have an hour slotted for this morning's discussion, and uh, we'll leave time for uh, Q&A at, at, uh, at, at the back end of the session. So just a, a, a brief introduction. Uh, we work for Genesis Solutions, Quinton and I, and we became part of the American Bureau of Shipping. Uh, the ABS has a consulting group, and we belong to the ABS uh, group of companies. Uh, ABS is a worldwide leader in process safety management and mechanical integrity. Uh, many of the principals there have authored books and helped develop the, uh, the codes. As you can see, our uh, combined portfolio of services, uh, Genesis Solutions, as part of ABS Consulting Group, uh, we provide a full suite of engineering services, uh, absolutely focused on reliability, but uh, involve computerized maintenance management system uh, installations, uh, reliability-centered maintenance, both at the strategic and the tactical level. Uh, when we talk about asset management master planning, uh, we're really talking about uh, you know, a strategic approach to uh, uh, implementing maintenance excellence uh, improvements. As far as the, uh, the importance of asset management, um, you know, considering the economic climate that we currently operate in, asset management is a key contributor to the overall spend, and the cost is just a measure of the uh, health of your maintenance organization. You know, we recognize not only do our customers compete against similar service providers within their uh, competitive industry, but they also compete against the other sites within their network. One of the principal tenets of TPM uh, is the concept of total participation, which we focus on um, throughout the presentation today. You'll see that in a number of areas uh, to include the operator care piece of that, and that's the basis of our master plan uh, development. Um, it's, it's completely comprehensive of all aspects of the operation. And the bottom line is, as maintenance professionals and, and those of you that are responsible for maintenance pr professionals, um, the ultimate goal is to minimize risk of the assets that we manage. So OEE is uh, overall equipment effectiveness, and, and we find that uh, while it may not be applicable to every unit operation that we get involved with, it's certainly one of the most important metrics we've come upon. And we look at asset management master planning as an exercise where uh, it, sh it should result in improving uh, all the components that constitute the OEE metric. 
So we're looking at reducing breakdowns, uh, leaning, up, leaning out the, uh, the setup time, and uh, making it more consistent to improve equipment availability. Regarding equipment performance, uh, so many times we go in and look at the way equipment is run. It doesn't match the uh, commissioning or the validated state of the equipment. So whether it's an air handler or a piece of uh, packaging or filling equipment, uh, it's operating typically at a reduced rate for some reason, uh, some reason sometimes not known, or sometimes uh, just because it, it's, it's always seems to operate that way. Uh, we also look to uh, monitor the amount of stops that uh, we occur on equipment, as well, and also the, the quality of the, uh, the manufacturing process. So well, the goal here is to uh, unleash the hidden factory. Uh, there's a lot of uh, capacity that's either wasted or not taken advantage of, uh, unfortunately, because folks are living with uh, very low OEE levels. So we want to stress this as a, as a key metric. So as I said, you know, I spent 28 years at Wyeth Pharmaceuticals uh, before it was acquired by uh, Pfizer. And uh, a lot of the uh, beginning phases of uh, asset management master planning and site assessment methodologies occurred during my tenure there. I was responsible for a network of uh, 30 sites and the, uh, the reliability, uh, right first time quality, and the overall operational excellence associated with those plan operations. So what I've learned from uh, my experience, uh, and I hope to share with you this morning, is the importance of uh, developing pilots, developing a proof of concept to get a buy-in. Uh, your initiatives uh, have to have a meaningful business impact. Uh, I've always said you can't push a rope. And so to create a pull uh, and to become recognized by uh, your continuous improvement uh, or operational excellence uh, leadership uh, and looking to become uh, you know, recognized as a, as, a, as a best practice, we think we've got some useful information uh, in the next uh, few slides. So this is uh, the maintenance iceberg. And I like to refer to the maintenance iceberg because it really tells the full maintenance story. Too many times maintenance is known for what appears above the waterline there. So uh, unfortunately, maintenance is perceived as an overhead center uh, because of the labor, the overtime, material costs. But the really important thing is to look at the indirect maintenance costs, the impact it has on uh, energy. So uh, poor maintenance effectiveness uh, certainly is going to result in an energy penalty. Uh, there's going to be a lot of waste. Uh, we have Clinton, Marine Six Sigma Black Belt, uh, one of the uh, key uh, principles of the Six Sigma process is to uh, optimize right first time quality, reduce the waste strength, we'll talk more about that, uh, avoid rework and lost business. So in particular, what uh, we encourage is to really understand your program drivers. For me, program drivers were a lot of new product launches, uh, products that were just shy of a billion dollars in sales and with uh, better reliability, uh, better first time quality. They could exceed the billion-dollar threshold and join the billion-dollar club. Uh, a lot of us work in regulated environments, uh, whether they're uh, energy, uh, environmental, or uh, good manufacturing processes, etc. Uh, we want to focus on uh, being compliant, uh, but at the same time not lose our effectiveness. So we call that uh, operational excellence. Everyone on the phone, uh, to everyone on this session today has uh, what I call a reliability imperative. Just to share my reliability imperative was uh, we at one time were the sole provider of a life-saving vaccine that uh, was supposed to be uh, provided to newborn babies as part of a four-dose regimen. And unfortunately, the uh, product was launched in uh, antiquated, unreliable facilities. The new facility was delayed in startup, and we had a shortage of this vaccine. It was in all the major newspapers. And so uh, my reliability imperative was making sure that we were able to uh, address these, uh, these shortages and uh, have enough dosages, dosages to support a worldwide demand. What I did was I looked at uh, my network of sites and did some benchmarking. And what I, find, what, what I found was that uh, my plants, which I refer to as the Acme plants, had a very high uh, unit cost as compared to uh, our competitors. And even among my own plants, uh, there was a, a tremendous disparity in terms of our cost profile. And so one of the things that we encouraged is to really understand your cost data 
and to uh, do some benchmarking to really understand uh, where you are in terms of your competitors as well as your internal competition. So EN15341, that's a European uh, standard for maintenance metrics. I uh, very much appreciate the uh, European standard because it's broken down into three main categories, economic, technical, and organizational indicators. E4 is an economic indicator, and it looks at total maintenance cost uh, as, a, as a percentage of the product transformation cost. So product transformation cost excludes, excludes raw materials, but uh, looking at maintenance cost the way it's defined in E4, it does include utilities, which brings us back to the maintenance iceberg. Uh, having poor maintenance, uh, having poor efficiency of cooling towers, chiller operations, water chemistry has a maintenance penalty, and that uh, can be seen in higher energy costs. So uh, I would encourage you to understand your E4 for each one of your specific products or SKUs. So as part of asset management master planning and the site assessment process, I used something that was very easy to uh, deploy. And essentially, I looked at the world in terms of five buckets, people, process, systems, technology, and governance, and of course, from an engineering operations perspective. And I found that uh, you know a lot of our folks really uh, were very familiar with reliability, sensor maintenance, total productive maintenance, uh, failure modes, and effect analysis. They were familiar with it, but they didn't implement it. So when we went ahead and assessed our sites, we graded ourselves in terms of implementation, not knowledge, but the actual implementation of course our sites. And you can see the red, yellow, green scorecard was associated with varied degree, various degrees of implementation. So again, I had 30 sites. These were the domestic sites uh, in the Americas. And uh, something very telling uh, from this slide, which I shared with uh, my executive team, because I was looking for an executive sponsor for my maintenance excellence program. And very readily, uh, you know, if you're a site manager, you're looking at this vertically, and you're taking a look at which site you may, you may be. And uh, I, I use the uh, sites to protect the, uh, the incident, if you will. But uh, if you're a plant manager and you're site number one, you're really focused on this as a, as a vertical scorecard. But you're, if you're a senior leader within the organization, you're looking at this thing horizontally as well and looking for opportunities where you could leverage, let's say, best practices coming out of the site six, seven, or nine and spread that best practice across the network. And where there are no best practices, to actually leverage the power of the, net, of the network to develop that best practice in a collaborative manner. That's a very important part of uh, total uh, uh, participation or that TPM benefit that I mentioned before. So this was my global footprint. Again, had plants all around the world. And so our experience around uh, site uh, assessments and the uh, master planning effort is a, a result of this global deployment. Now, I will mention that uh, 13 years ago, when Genesis Solutions uh, first came to, uh, to exist, uh, I work with Genesis Solutions as my, as my business partner. So while I've been with Genesis Solutions now for three years, uh, the, the model that we're going to talk about is, uh, is nearly 13 years old. Communities of practice is uh, a really great implementation tool for those of you that are uh, in a network with multiple sites. So if you're, one, if you're just uh, one or two sites, it may not uh, pay to uh, follow a community of practice type of uh, network. But if you do have a global footprint, I strongly uh, recommend you look at the American Productivity Quality Council uh, methodology for uh, designing and launching a community of practice. But the key things here would be to uh, align your program with your uh, business strategy, your company strategy, key business objectives for the next uh, you know, year, three, five years. Uh, we call that strategic planning in terms of finding the uh, right folks and having a right accountability to uh, you know, develop the uh, asset management uh, master plan. And so this is an example of the uh, various communities of practice that I had uh, the pleasure of uh, working with. Uh, reliability, sensitive maintenance, utilities, calibration, and automation. So again, you're not limited to uh, the numbers of communities of practice, but you do want to avoid a full start, and that's why I suggest that you follow the uh, APQC framework. I'd also bring your attention to the methods and tools of clearly the computerized maintenance management system. Uh, the uh, PDM technologies are, are important in terms of systems and technology. But uh, regarding uh, KPIs and uh, organizational management controls, reporting systems, 
I'm a firm believer in engineering and maintenance councils where you get the stakeholders, uh, you get to listen to the voice of the customer in terms of your, uh, your, your strategic business partners so that they have visibility to the program and the program results. So, uh, you know, as I said, I'll share with you what I did right, what I did wrong, and uh, maintenance excellence when applied properly does have some uh, meaningful uh, business impact. And again, of course, very diverse businesses as well. Uh, we were reactive uh, in our maintenance stage. Uh, Clinton will take us through the various uh, uh, maintenance evolutionary stages. But uh, I was at a very uh, immature state when I first began this program with many of the sites. And uh, eventually, we exceeded 85% in terms of proactive uh, maintenance labor. Our manufacturing investigations that resulted in re rework or product scrap was reduced by 60%. Uh, and uh, to get those products to join the Billion Dollar Club, we, we improved our critical uh, equipment uptime, our OEE metrics, by reducing downtime, in some cases greater than 40%. So it had a meaningful impact on our operating bu budget. Uh, tens of millions of dollars were recognized by our, by our finance team. This is an example of a, of a pilot project. Uh, the case was uh, for an uh, antibiotic uh, manufacturing facility. Uh, we use control charts. When we do our EAM seminars, we talk about the importance of control charting for visibility. This is an example of the kind of uh, control charts a maintenance council would review, uh, looking at mean time between failures, uh, the mean time to repair, uh, the availability or uptime component of the OE that I mentioned. So what we do is we draw a process chart around the key process, the, the key process equipment, uh, really identify the bad actors here. Uh, and then look at whether or not we need to do an FMEA, a partial FMEA, or uh, just uh, focus on a, a PM optimization to begin with. But again, uh, keeping visibility on, uh, on our assets and asset performance. This is the same example, uh, now taking that control chart and putting it into a total equipment downtime trend, again, to review in the maintenance council. The interesting thing I'd like to point out here is uh, when, I, when I went to this site, it had uh, three filling lines. And uh, one of the lines was taken out of service as part of the capital project improvement. And so uh, to begin this maintenance excellence program and looking at this manufacturing train, I already lost one third of my installed capacity. So uh, you know, this, this particular product never did more than 30 million doses a year. You can see from the downtime trend that we did get the production improvement we're looking at, I gained additional $200 million in sales and uh, reached 40 million doses, so a 30% increase in production. So again, this doesn't happen overnight. It's a concerted effort. And the, uh, the ability to really assess the weaknesses of the plan operation through the site assessment process, and then to come up with the, the defined project plan as part of the master planning effort was, uh, was part of the key success factors for this project. So now I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Quentin again. And Clinton's going to take us through how this program evolved and uh, utilized a, a Six Sigma process. Thanks, Mike. Um, you know, the approach that we took is we took the, the maintenance master planning groundwork that was developed by Mike and his team over more than a decade um, in collaboration with Genesis. And we applied a, a Lean Six Sigma uh, methodology to evolve to what we call uh, asset management master planning today. Um, and, and it's focused, obviously, on the, the, the start of it, the EAM assessment, and we'll get into details there. But we still focus on the same foundational concepts. We just formalized their approach um, using the DMAIC process. And we found that our, our updated approach um, aligns well with continuous improvement, uh, TPM, Lean Six Sigma, uh, operational excellence, all the programs that are out there. Um, we tie in because our foundation is the, the same basic concepts. As far as the argamaic approach, um, from a defined perspective, we define what we're measuring ourselves against. Um, and we'll share with you over the next uh, six slides, I believe, is the asset management maturity continuum and the different states which reside within there. Um, the next step is the measurement piece. That's the actual assessment. Uh, we call it the EAM assessment. Um, but there's different assessments that can be done. And the goal there is to identify leverage points and opportunities as they apply to your asset management program. The analyze piece that's performing the gap analysis, so really deeping, uh, diving deep into your uh, leverage points and opportunities to develop a plan for improvement. The improvement piece is uh, implementation of that plan, and ultimately the control is the governance model to ensure not only do you improve, but you sustain those improvements. So you don't want to spend money 
or spend uh, time and resources on improving and then not have that, uh, those improvements sustained or those gains sustained. And as far as our engagement, um, it's a three-step process. We assess first, develop a master plan second, and then ultimately serve as a strategic business partner as a part of that implementation. And as a part of the improvement effort, um, obviously there's tactical engagements um, that can be executed. And uh, you know, we can assist there as far as asset criticality ranking, uh, PM optimization, so optimize your kind of preventive maintenance program, uh, configuring your CMMS, Maximo, SAP, uh, data stream, a number of them, of them out there, uh, as well as just assisting optimizing and planning and scheduling and, and MRO inventory management. Um, and the goal is that, you know, as a strategic business partner, um, we want to ensure that there's a knowledge transfer from our subject matter experts that are assisting in these improvement processes to the in-house resources that are ultimately going to sustain that amount of success. As a part of the defined step in the DMAG process, here's the uh, asset management maturity continuum um, that we measure against. And one thing to note, we're still tracking the people, process, uh, systems, technology, and governance that was developed by Mike and his team. Um, and our approach is to classify each site within the organization on this continuum to understand the, uh, the opportunities at hand. And uh, one other thing to note, <clears throat> you have specific characteristics that are aligned with each state of the maturity continuum. For example, when you're in the reactive state, you have the fighter, fighter fighting heroes. <clears throat> you know, as you transition up, you get to predictive. As far as the people, you're now into role-based training, where ultimately at the enterprise level, you know, you're using cross-training and you have a, a strong bench. Looking at the uh, reactive state, um, we look at each one of these states in three different perspectives, kind of the good, the bad, and the, the ROI. Um, so as far as when you're in the reactive state, you're fixing everything after it fails. So it's completely reactive, uh, that firefighting approach like I mentioned before. And due to this approach, there's inherently a lot of bad. So you're going to have a high PM to CM ratio where most of your work is that uh, corrective maintenance or reactive maintenance. Um, you're constantly expediting parts. You're going to be firefighting and, and hurrying and fixing as fast as possible. And ultimately, that has a negative impact on production and waste. Um, and one thing to note in the reactive state, there isn't any good and, and there really isn't any uh, ROI. In the planned state, now you're beginning to fix things before they fail. Um, some of the bad has been removed. You can see it's been crossed out there. Um, and you begin to see some good behaviors and some ROI. Um, those are gains from the efficiencies in planning and scheduling and reducing your repair costs by um, limiting the, the expediting of parts. Um, you know, you see some of the ROI and the wrench time and contractor costs due to those efficiencies. And then one thing to note as far as, um, you know, the planning and scheduling excellence, you know, don't get it wrong that this is the ultimate phase. Some, some companies believe as soon as they get to the plan and schedule phase um, that that's the ultimate goal. But, you know, the thing to focus on there is you're not optimizing your maintenance performance due to the deficiencies that are built in by a calendar-based maintenance program. And normally, uh, if you talk to, I would say, nine out of the ten customers that we're engaged with now, um, you no, know, everyone's on a fixed time program, so they're they're PMing something on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, rather than uh, condition monitoring. And uh, the majority of failures aren't uh, based on time, but they're rather they're random, um, and that's nicely illustrated by Nolan Heaps' uh, failure curves that are out there. In the predictive state, now you're starting to measure before you fix. Um, your planning and scheduling is now becoming more optimized because you're utilizing predictive maintenance to ensure. You know, you're only replacing those items that are nearing the point of failure. Um, Mike will talk to the PF, the point of failure uh, curve, um, later on in the deck. Um, but the goal is that you want to replace things right before they fail. Um, you know, a good example of the opposite of that would be your, uh, <clears throat> your filters that you have in an air handling unit. Um, a number of the sites that we've worked with, they're just replacing them every month as opposed to using the, the differential pressure and replacing them once they hit a certain limit. Um, and the goal there is that your focus needs to be on doing the right work. The reliability state, um, now you're beginning to improve your performance. You're not only remediating issues, but you're actually you know, starting a data-driven process and you're making some of your routine uh, issues go away. Um, your approach now transitions from the predictive maintenance on all the assets, which you know, a number of customers, they just want to pull vibration in and, and they'll do a vibration on all the motors that they have in the site rather than using an asset criticality ranking and only performing that predictive maintenance on the assets that you deem critical. Um, you know, from the good, you continue to add items <clears throat> such as, you know, your risk-based approach and now your design improvements on your capital uh, expenditures. And when you're purchasing new equipment, you're now embedding um, kind of a, 
improved design to ensure that some of your routine failures from your CMMS uh, data analysis, you're making those go away. So you're designing out potential failures for the future. And as far as your ROI, you start to extend your asset life and also um, you're starting to see a benefit on the right, right first time quality uh, based on those designs. And the enterprise state, um, it's kind of the, the ultimate goal to achieve. And you know, it's not necessarily for everyone. It's more for companies uh, with a network of sites or um, complex operations where business practices can be leveraged um, across those sites. So you know, job plan templates, master data templates for calibration, um, standard business processes, so how you operate on a daily basis, those can be replicated across multiple sites and really only done once. You don't have to have that, uh, that spend or that effort um, in, in each individual site. You can do it once to knock them all out. And then also, also the, uh, the CMMS configuration. Um, and we can't emphasize enough how important the CMMS is to your operational efficiency and even the data analysis and ensuring that that CMMS is configured to support uh, the execution of work on a daily basis. Uh, lastly, an example would be um, having MRO spare depots, spare part depots, to where you can have one central location to keep a lot of those critical spares that maybe you know you, you would only use once a year, or uh, you know if you don't have it, you're going to be down for several months. But um, you know each of the sites doesn't want to keep one because of the expense that it has, so you keep one that can be remotely located and accessed from the multiple sites. After we've defined uh, what we're measuring ourselves against, the next step. Uh, is the measurement piece of the demand process. And we do that through the, the site assessments. Uh, our assessment approach is a data-driven pro data process. Um, and the, the Lean Six Sigma concepts that we've used from that is the data collection plans, including operational definition for each inspection point, as well as the method of measurement. So we really need to understand what we're assessing, how we're assessing, and really how we're measuring and analyzing it. Um, this is to ensure consistency and continuity when you're assessing multiple sites. So I know that's one of the common things is, you know, how can we ensure that we're all being measured equally? And, and we put a lot of work, a tremendous amount of work and time into ensuring that, um, that it is a, it's a very objective process and it's a data-driven process. Um, you know, and we've mentioned it a couple times, but once again, you know, we, we focus heavily on total participation. So we're going to interview and survey members um, from all aspects of the operations, the operations team, uh, maintenance, engineering, quality, purchasing, they're all going to take part in defining that current state because really this serves as a foundation for your improvement efforts. So the more accurately defined your current state is, obviously um, that tees you up for a successful uh, remediation plan to improve. Um, and the, the ultimate goal through this data collection process and our assessment approach is to ensure that we have the voice of the customer. So we understand, you know, where are their pain points, what's going on, what are, where are they strong, where are they weak, and, uh, you know, how can you leverage and, and address each one of those. As far as what we're assessing, um, here's the seven elements of what we consider the seven elements of EAM, or the seven areas that we look into. And just to quickly go through uh, each one, uh, starting at the top there, the CMMS functionality and utilization. That's how well is the CMS being leveraged. Is it being used? Is it configured properly? Or is it just something that you paid for and you still have all your uh, users complaining on how they wish they had the old system? Uh, inventory management, how well is the MRO spares program managed? Are you doing cycle counts? Are you monitoring inventory turns? Uh, metrics and performance improvement. What KPIs are used to drive those improvements and sustain the results? We talked about the, the sustainability piece as the control aspect of the make process. But what do you have in place right now to ensure that what you're doing is the right things uh, and also at the same time that you, you're setting goals to improve? The maintenance and reliability strategy. Um, you know, is there a data-driven strategy in place to deploy and utilize your resources effectively? We talked about you know transitioning through the maturity continuum, and a big part of that is you know are your guys working on the right things? It's one thing to say that you're 100% compliant on PMs, but are your PMs the right PMs? Organizational organizational readiness. Uh, does the organization have the proper structure in place and controls as well to support a culture of continuous? And the last two, uh, first planning and scheduling, and that's to ensure that there is a difference between planning and scheduling. Um, more often than not, we go to a site and they're talking about planning, but they're actually talking about when they're going to schedule the work. So, you know, the planning is the preparation of that work to be executed, and the scheduling piece is effectively scheduling it and ensure it's aligned with the operation schedule. Uh, a big item that we run into and, and we focus on heavily is, does operations give maintenance the equipment um, to actually perform the improvements that they need to and perform the uh, repairs and uh, preventive maintenance tasks that they need to? 
And lastly, the work management. Um, that's the quality of the work execution on a daily basis and also how it's documented. You know, are there standard processes in place to ensure that um, the work is, is executed uh, to a quality perspective and that it um, supports a data-driven approach as far as capturing that history so you can analyze those results and ultimately improve your program. Each one of the seven elements is broken down uh, into components and subcomponents, and that's to ensure that there's a detailed approach to the assessment. Um, you know, and that helps with your path forward. It's one thing to come in and perform assessments, and that was one of my frustrations when I was working in the manufacturing sites, is we would have consultants come in and actually perform, perform assessments, but then what do you do with the results? And taking this uh, detailed approach, we ensure that we'll provide the customers is a very detailed uh, analysis of what are the next steps. You know, where are the leverage points, where are the opportunities, and what are those next steps need. Below is an example of how um, each one of those components is broken down into the subcomponents. And we actually have uh, over 250 inspection points that once again tie into each one of those seven elements um, as far as the assessment. When we score out each component, um, we once again list them as leverage points and opportunities, um, and that's to ensure uh, that there, the analysis can be done quickly when you're going into the, the plan development. And these findings will define the current state on your maturity continuum as these scores roll up. Um, and they'll also serve as the foundation of your master plan, um, prompting the specific actions to be taken. This is a, a depiction of the overall assessment results. We use the radar graphs um, that are very similar to the OPEX. I'm sure the those individuals um, on the webinar today are familiar with uh, these types to quickly show strengths and weaknesses that exist. Each of the seven elements is scored individually. You can note um, the smaller are each one of the seven elements scored out individually. Um, and then they're averaged to develop the total score and ultimately define the current state of which you operate in. And this provides a quick overview um, to see where your opportunities are at. You, know, you can note in this example, the site has the most opportunity in the inventory management and the planning and scheduling um, noted by the red color, which and uh, our classification defines the reactive state. So we go through and define each element uh, along the continuum and then ultimately roll it up as an overall program of where you reside within the uh, maturity continuum. You've seen the maturity continuum before. Um, and just as, this is just a, another depiction to show um, that the analyze step is used to develop that master plan. And the goal is to uh, perform a gap analysis and develop an incremental improvement plan to show how you can get from reactive to plan to predictive. And uh, one thing to note as well, um, you know, you, you can't expect to go from reactive to enterprise in a handful of years. Um, these are progressive programs. You want to ensure that the uh, results are sustainable and the gains are sustainable. And that's based on a, a developing systems and processes and standard operating procedures that, uh, and also training programs that ultimately um, you know, build the success of your company and your organization uh, within the systems, not necessarily the people. I've seen too many times where you have you know, a handful of cowboys at a site, and that site you know, performs well over two years, and they're up to maybe you get to the predictive level or just a high level of performance, however you measure it. And then all of a sudden, those guys get pulled off to help other sites. Six months later, they're back to the reactive state. So the, uh, the master plan is um, the plan to develop incremental uh, steps to progress through the maturity. This slide shows um, kind of the correlation between the assessment and the master plan development, how they're linked. Uh, each subcomponent that is assessed will impact, impact the building block of your master plan. Um, you can notice the master plan building blocks on the bottom, and then once again, the element component, subcomponent breakdown from the assessment uh, process up above. And you know there are areas where multiple subcomponents impact the same building block. So you know we talked about having areas of opportunities. Each one of these areas of opportunity uh, will prompt for a corrective action as a part of your master plan. And then here's another example of that master plan. You probably couldn't read it, obviously, on the, the smaller slide there. But here's an example of a four-phase uh, asset management master plan that we developed recently. And our approach is to work from the bottom up, uh, you know, building your foundation for improvement. And the overall process map should be utilized to quickly and effectively portray the path forward. This is something that you can use. And, and we are incorporate the same type of implementation effort uh, or implementation concept that uh, Mike and his team developed as far as how is it implemented? So when we go through the assessment, we're really measuring those as inspection points. But when we approach the master plan improvement, this would be implementation. So how well is each one of these implemented? And we use the same red, yellow, green approach. And the goal there would be everything on phase one as the foundation would need to be green. 
um, prior to moving on to phase two. As far as the master plan project outline, it needs to be treated just as an engineering project is. Um, you need to have uh, you know, each action with designated required man hours for completion, a priority to define you know, the, the rate of execution per week, you know, your target rate of how you're going to execute each one of those tasks because you're going to be resource constrained. Um, also, you want to look at an execution schedule, and you're going to, you want to have associated milestones for the purpose of delineating the scope of work to be integrated. And it's important that you understand your barriers in developing these plans to prevent false starts and, and sudden stops. You know, the last thing that you want to do is get a bunch of momentum behind you, execute for a number of months, and then all of a sudden the plug is pulled. So what we provide is a project manager checklist um, to the customers or the team leads. Uh, as well as a proposed schedule and budget up front with a formal review prior to execution for rescaling if needed. You know, there's a there's a full blown approach where you want to address the whole network, and you're gonna uh, you have the support from uh, senior leadership and from the stakeholders where you can approach it in that matter. And and I guess the um, on the other side of that would be a pilot program that's just one department of your operation. Where once again, to Mike's point, you prove the concept, you expand it within the plant, then you expand it within that within the network. And one thing, one key thing as far as um, how you resource your improvement effort is the approach that you take. And the way that we look at it is, you know, running the business and improving the business, and then ultimately sustaining it. And most of the customers that we deal with fail because they try to do both. They try to run and improve with their own resources, and they don't have the bandwidth to do so. You know, if you look at it, any improvement effort, whether it's uh, pertaining to asset management or maintenance or even operational excellence. It's, you know, do you have the expertise in-house, and then do you have the necessary, necessary time and resources to execute each one of those tasks that need to be done? You know, one of the things that we focus on is that it's imperative to have that proper resourcing plan developed in advance to ensure that uh, you have that expertise and resource on site when you execute the project. And our approach is to ensure that we have that ex exit strategy, like I mentioned before. So if you have external resources coming in to help, it's not just a temporary fix. Part of that improvement effort and part of that outside uh, expertise assistance is a knowledge transfer so that the, um, the knowledge is transferred on to those internal resources that are going to sustain the long-term success of the operation. And the last slide I have here before I uh, hand it back over to Mike um, to get us wrapped up here um, is just an overall depiction of our transformation process uh, for the master plan implementation. And I won't read to each one of them. Just one thing that I want to emphasize is uh, the, the gain endorsement piece there. And you know, note that um, you have to have that endorsement from those key stakeholders if you're going to make a large-scale uh, transformation. You can approach it from a pilot perspective to start to build that momentum and gain it. But if you're going to approach it from a large-scale perspective, you want to ensure that you have that uh, senior leadership endorsement and they support it. And just in closing, you know, this isn't just a maintenance initiative. And if it is, you know, there's a high level of uh, probability that it's going to fail. It needs to be a complete operational initiative and obviously you know maintenance is going to have, have the lion's share they'll probably have 80 percent of the execution but without that key operational engagement without that key uh, representation from quality and purchasing and finance um, the program it's going to be difficult for the program to be successful thanks Glenn. and uh, one thing that uh, we'll be sure to mention is that if uh, you go to the uh, company website we uh, we have that uh, that last uh, transformation chart as part of a asset management master planning article that Clint and I co-authored. So uh, we'd encourage you to, uh, to read through it because we are covering a lot of material. And uh, you know, we don't uh, complete assessments and global maintenance excellence uh, master planning in, uh, <laughs> in short time. So it, it is uh, uh, an effort and it requires some strategic planning. Now, as part of uh, circling back, I talked about people, process, systems, technology, and governance as part of uh, this uh, maintenance excellence, uh, reliability excellence improvement effort. And one of the things that I utilized was the, uh, the dashboard as part of the governance model. So the dashboard is not intended uh, for, for site operations. It's, it's more intended for your, uh, your business sponsors and your customers so that they really understand the value proposition of continuing uh, to support the program. So I kept it simple and I selected three metrics. And this was uh, every plant in my network, so 30 plants constituted my dashboard, and I segregated them by business division. But the first metric that I selected, you can see, was called manufacturing deviations. And when I first selected that metric, 
I got a lot of folks challenging me uh, in terms of, you know, what kind of maintenance metric is that? And uh, what we did was we trended and tracked any adverse event that impacted manufacturing as a result of engineering, maintenance, facilities, utilities, or automation operations because uh, that was the impact that we had on the waste stream. And the philosophy that we had as part of our maintenance implementation strategy is that we were going to get an improvement in right first time quality. Uh, we were going to proceduralize and map our business processes and workflows so that we would have less deviations. And uh, you know, green showed an improving trend, and you can see how uh, there were some trials. And eventually, things began to normalize. Uh, the middle uh, metric there is maintenance proactivity. So looking at our labor codes and our uh, CMMS systems and working with the various uh, CMMS coordinators at the site, we finally agreed on the various work codes, whether it was a Maxima or SAPPM or JD Edwards, whatever. But everybody was measuring everything the right, the, the same way. And uh, with that, uh, one of the things I want to point out is the importance of setting an achievable and attainable goal. So what you can see there is I set my maintenance proactivity level at 75%. 75% was quite achievable, especially for many of our plants that began in the reactive mode. As I mentioned earlier in the introduction to this uh, webinar, uh, my sites eventually maintained uh, proactive labor rates at greater than 85%. But I was careful not to start with raising the bar too high because there's nothing worse than a full start or demotivating the, uh, the workforce. And finally, looking at critical equipment uh, maintenance downtime. So working with the stakeholders to understand what importance uh, they placed on certain equipment that supported their unit operation and keeping that equipment in the limelight. And that's what we did. So uh, you know, keeping your performance visible, uh, keeping that dashboard visible is, is, is a very important uh, uh, program element. This is intended to be a plan view, and there's three sections. And the base of your uh, program, as Quentin uh, said uh, numerous times in his talk, was the computerized maintenance management system. Your database is, is very important. Uh, having an accurate master equipment list, having the, uh, the right asset hierarchy so that uh, if you're doing uh, uh, you know, data review, trying to do a Pareto analysis around your bad actors, uh, separating the many from the trivial, uh, from, from, from actually the critical few where the bulk of your spend and effort is uh, being placed, it's really important to uh, have a good handle on your computerized uh, maintenance management system and associated database. Using problem remedy course codes, uh, completing an asset criticality uh, review, and uh, having these key performance indicators, that's really the foundation for your strategy, your program. Whether you call it operational excellence, continuous improvement, TPM, uh, that's the, the important thing is, is that your, your, your path forward is supported by data. Uh, as far as your reliability strategy, we encourage you uh, following uh, our approach, which is the uh, DMAIC process, really defining that maintenance maturity continuum, going ahead, assessing the sites, and then uh, based on the site assessment, uh, coming up with a prioritized uh, set of improvement uh, uh, actions that are defined in a, uh, a project plan. And then finally, uh, organization, very important looking at uh, your people, your, your, your processes to uh, promote a learning organization. So as Quinton uh, showed in the uh, maintenance maturity continuum and as part of the master planning effort, we're looking for incremental improvement. Uh, if you're a reactive site, you're not going to look to become uh, a, 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 a and, and have a step function change and hit the reliability of the enterprise domain in 12 to 18 months. Uh, it, it's not going to, uh, to happen. So really, again, going back to setting incremental goals, attainable goals, if you're in a reactive domain, then we strive to get to the planned domain. If we're planned, we try to get into predictive. And uh, based on my experience, and this is based on uh, you know, 13 years of asset management master plan implementations, uh, I threw out these numbers here as some targets for uh, ROI modeling. So for example, if you're in the reactive phase, chances are your range time is 25%. And as you move into the higher domain, you can achieve a, a range time of uh, you know, the, the high 50%, uh, 60%, or even greater. Uh, OEE, your uh, availability factor, 
chances are if you're reactive, your uptime is about 80%. You have a lot of unscheduled downtime. So you can get tremendous OEE improvement on the availability factor by moving up the maturity continuum. Uh, your labor cost savings. Uh, there's a 35% bogey moving from reactive to the enterprise domain. A lot of that is contract maintenance cost reduction. Uh, also, without the asset criticality ranking, you're trying to maintain all the assets under roof, uh, and that's uh, not a risk-based approach. Uh, doing calendar-based maintenance, you lose a lot of efficiency at the past uh, as opposed to condition-based maintenance. Uh, your inventory carrying force, uh, there's some opportunities there. But clearly, this slide will depict one thing we can agree on. If you're in the reactive state, it's, uh, it's not acceptable state to, to operate in. There's a lot of uh, unplanned maintenance that's uh, raising your safety and quality uh, management risk to an unacceptable level. And finally, uh, for those of you familiar with the point of failure curve, you know, we're running our equipment in an optimized condition, and then at some point, uh, at point P, we have a potential failure beginning. Uh, Quentin and I were very strong uh, proponents of uh, total, uh, total, pro pro total production, uh, total participatory uh, maintenance. Uh, we, believe, we believe in uh, the TPM model. Um, but uh, that said, audible noise, hot surfaces, uh, the damage has already uh, become so significant that you're talking about a replacement. Early intervention is the key. Uh, early signals, early, early failure detection by predictive maintenance technology is where we want to be. So we say, you know, life is better lived at the top of the curve. Uh, you have less interruptions and uh, less firefighting. Uh, heroes aren't rewarded. And you're really getting into the root cause failure analysis and the early intervention. Uh, another thing to talk about in the PF curve is the role of engineering for reliability. So getting your reliability engineers, your maintenance professionals, to get involved with uh, equipment selection as part of uh, the uh, preliminary design stage that your uh, capital engineering folks are doing. Uh, unfortunately, most of my experience in maintenance, uh, I see maintenance as a, uh, as a retrospective organization. They're always fixing things that uh, were broken upon arrival. And so one of the worst things to do is inherit a brand new system that came from your engineering department to find out that it wasn't designed for reliability. So using a total cost of ownership model, uh, maybe go with uh, something that uh, had a higher first cost, but over the, the course of, it, of the asset's life, its uh, operational and maintenance costs are less. So again, this all ties into the, uh, the PF curve. And just as, as part of a summary and closing here, um, you know, you're, you're ultimately, your program uh, benefits and your strategy need to be tied into um, your asset and maintenance management reliability improvements. And those should focus on the bottom line of improving um, your operational performance as well as reducing your maintenance spend. Um, you know, we specialize in supporting and leading these efforts from both a strategic and tactical perspective. And, and ultimately, we see ourselves as an extension of your team and a part of the value stream. And, and that should be the expectation regardless of you know, what third party you guys work with, they should be a part of that value stream process. And ultimately, our goal is to look for areas to lean out the process and ensure that the improvement effort is as efficient as possible. Um, you know, no matter if it's an external cost for um, a third party resource or if you're hiring uh, new reliability engineers, um, you want to optimize that spend as a part of that improvement effort. So you need to look for any possible area where you can lean out your process and, and make your resources more efficient on a daily basis. Thanks, Clinton. And in, in closing, I would say that uh, I, I spent a lot of time uh, in executive management. And uh, you know, a lot of what we spoke about today is a course in leadership. So as far as the maintenance maturity curve uh, and leadership, you know, know where you are. So the site assessment, you can, with data, uh, show your, uh, your, your plant leadership and your stakeholders, your, uh, your, your customers, exactly where you are. And then as part of leadership, if you know where you are, know where you're going, and that's part of your asset management master plan, to have a, a concrete path forward with the associated return on the investment, the value stream, to get the necessary endorsements and sponsorship. So we're hoping that this gives you the tools that you need to create that value stream, that business proposition, so that you can get support for your uh, asset management master planning and uh, improvement efforts. 
So uh, one of the questions that had came in was that uh, you know do we have a PDF copy of this uh, of this presentation? There's a lot of material there. Absolutely, we'd encourage you to go to the uh, this website uh, at uh, ABS Consulting or uh, GenesisSolutions.com. Uh, you can also reach out to Quentin and I or our email address, and we're happy to. Uh, uh, provide you with any uh, additional information that uh, you may require. But uh, I'll, I'll, uh, are there any uh, questions that anybody wants to type in? We have a, a few minutes for me to address. While you're doing that, I just want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, I know you're all busy with the, the day job. Uh, Quint and I certainly hope that this material was of value to you and that you consider applying the systematic approach to your maintenance and uh, reliability improvement efforts. So again, uh, you know, please uh, feel free to uh, to reach out to us. And like Mike mentioned, if time doesn't permit today, or um, if you guys have to move on to another part of your operation, feel free to contact us via email um, or our, our cell phones there um, with any further questions or follow up. Uh, we'll be happy to answer that. Okay, I don't see any additional questions, Quentin. So uh, again, thank you very much for your participation, and we look forward to uh, seeing you at our next uh, uh, event. Uh, it looks like there is uh, there's a couple coming in right now, Mike. Um, okay, uh, a good question on uh, PAS 55, and if we have aligned any of this with uh, our clients. So uh, absolutely, uh, you'll find that uh, PAS 55 and the uh, site assessment methodology and master planning improvement effort uh, aligns very nicely uh, with uh, PAS uh, 55. And so does the uh, ABS uh, PSM mechanical integrity uh, improvement efforts, I might add. Looks like that was the, uh, the only question that came in on PAS 55. Well, once again, thanks everyone for your attendance and your time today, and uh, we look forward to uh, 